We're in business to save the planet, and we use making clothes to do that. The cure for depression is action. Every one of us has to step up and do what you can according to what your resources are. That was the voice of Patagonia's Yvonne Chouinard. And this is Type 2, a podcast from Looking Sideways in association with Patagonia that explores the intersection between outdoors, action sports and activism. Now in each show, I'll be meeting people who are using their passion and involvement with the cultures we all love to create change. We're going to be discussing the issues they're involved in, the change they're seeking to create, the difficulties involved and the rewards that follow. Now my guest for the first episode of Type 2 is Greg Long, legendary big wave surfer from San Clemente, who made his name as a standout at the planet's biggest and most intimidating waves. Scary and often cold monsters such as mavericks and dungeons and places I've generally got no interest in ever experiencing. He's won the Eddie, the Red Bull Titans of Mavericks and multiple XXL awards, including Biggest Wave, Ride of the Year and Performance of the Year. Then in December 2012, at the height of his powers, Greg suffered a wipeout at Cortez Bank that almost killed him and certainly changed his life. It was an experience that led to an epiphany that put him on the path he's following today. He still surfs the world's biggest waves, but he's also committed to using his platform to share his experiences and knowledge in practical and productive ways, whether that's through his work with the Big Wave Risk Assessment Group or by raising awareness about ways we can protect the ocean environment and help solve the challenges ahead. Now, I met Greg on a recent visit to Huntington Beach and we sat down to record this conversation about his own approach to activism in the light of the experience that changed his life. It's fair to say that we got on pretty well, me and Greg. I really enjoyed this chat and I hope you do too. So here it is, me and Greg Long. Enjoy. So I'm with Greg. How are you, Greg? I'm doing fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for coming over to Huntington to see us. So you're yeah. San Clemente, right? Yeah, San Clemente, about 45 minutes south, so it's yeah. an, an oh. easy one. Yeah. Nice. And I catch you just before you're off on some travels. So you're going to Whistler tomorrow and then Australia. So what are you going to be up to? Uh, heading up to Whistler for it's called an event called Multiplicity, being hosted by uh, Mountain Life Magazine. So given a presentation there, uh, my girlfriend actually lives up there as well. So get to spend some quality time before nice. I head off to Australia for about three weeks, uh, heading over to teach a couple of the um, call them BRAG courses, which is an acronym for Big Wave Risk Assessment Group. Yeah. Um, so it's essentially an ocean safety awareness um, multi-day course that is really just getting people more, um, you know, thinking about safety um, before they enter the water, structuring a plan depending on you know, where they're going, and then uh, providing them the basic tools to handle themselves, um, whether it's breath hold training, uh, medical interventions, yeah, equipping so, people with the the tools for the for the environment. So this is so this is something you've been kind of pioneering, right? Like, so yeah, uh, the course has been going on for a few years, but this is the first year we're really taking it um, internationally. Most of the classes we we're I used to you know sit and take it every single year on the yeah. North Shore of Oahu. Brian Kalana was instructing it. Yeah, and then this year we've had a couple in California, and uh, I was brought on as one of the instructors because spent a lot of time on the road traveling, obviously, and yeah. um, you know, easier for me to uh, hit the road and uh, go and share this with the surfing communities around the around the world. So, you, so it's a it's a way of kind of addressing the increase in popularity for you know. I guess the lineups are getting fuller. There's more and more people coming in who perhaps don't have the requisite experience and skills. So is the idea to just kind of put in a bit of a standard that people should be aware of and to help them gain these skills so they can enjoy it more safely yeah absolutely that is one significant part of it uh with the popularity of big wave surfing a lot of you know new surfers coming onto the scene who you know haven't really put in the time or worked their way up kind of uh unfortunately that is something that is uh, a negative that's gone on with all the safety features we've implemented with inflatable yeah. suits and you know 
personal watercraft safety in the channel is you know people have this false sense of security so it was really complicating uh the big wave lineup so it's a way of you know inviting everybody in to you know teach them sort of the structure and protocol of you know how things operate at the different surf breaks yeah and you know bring them in as participants uh, yeah because you never know you know who's going to be around when something goes wrong and you know having somebody who's just sitting by idle and you know or doing something potentially hazardous because they had no background on that surf break yeah um so yeah we cover a lot uh you know cpr aed instruction breath hold training surf break analysis you know depending on where we're at geographically you know bringing es- experts on breaks to share with people you know where the safe zones what you have to watch out for yeah yeah you know, the phone numbers for you know direct medical services uh you know medical evacuation plans and getting people to start thinking about uh you know the safety side of it you yeah know, first to minimize the risks uh, and knowing how to work collaboratively together with the other members of their, whether it's a small crew that they travel with or in a perfect world. And what we're aiming for is, you know, every big wave lineup and small wave lineup, you know, will have people who have gone through this yeah. and be able to seamlessly work together if there is an emergency. Well, it is a really obvious parallel with backcountry skiing and snowboarding, right? Because in that environment, it's very socially unacceptable not to have the requisite skills and that's just something that's been accrued over over the decades really isn't it you know from back in the day when people would just turn up and and take very um, naive risks let's just say but really in those environments now it's just not acceptable and that's just come from from education and and courses and training so is that is that is that a parallel that you see is like a similar kind of you know culture really that you're trying to implement in in this arena absolutely um and prior to this course there was really nowhere that you could go to get that base of knowledge unless you were doing uh you know professional lifeguard you know training and even then um you know that doesn't necessarily cross over to what we're dealing with you know it's very specific right So, yeah, we've been building out a curriculum of three different level courses, um, you know, one day, two day, three day, and um, still learning, you know, a significant amount. This is all coming from uh, Brian Kailana, who's sort of the godfather of uh, heavy water ocean rescue, implementing the, you know, jet ski personal watercraft. So um, he is the, you know, guru and been slowly, you know, passing on the information, uh, you know, to a number of big wave surfers and lifeguards, and we've been really refining it every single um, after every course that we're you know teaching of you know based off of feedback and then our own personal you know, sort of experience interacting with uh, those who are coming to to take the course to really you know dial it in, and then especially for every geographical location, as there's nuances to the surf breaks, to the you know culture, to the accessibility to medical um you know help so um yeah it's been a lot of fun and a lot of you know personal growth for me on that front where i came from a lifeguarding background my dad was a lifeguard for 38 years and that was something that he instilled with us as you know in our youth and you know something i always kind of implemented into my own big wave surfing practices but now to be on the opposite side of you know teaching it um, you know, basically going back and studying it all again from uh, a different perspective. Yeah, so, that must be fascinating. Yeah, very, very uh, enriching. And, yeah. Uh, well, it's really progressive. That's what immediately strikes me because, you know, there can be a culture in surfing of effectively when people don't have the knowledge of push, keeping them at arm's length and pushing them away. So it's it's progressive, isn't it? Like you say, to invite people in and and say, well, actually, we just need to, to help and pass on the education and knowledge like openly. To, mm-hmm. to make it safer for everybody. Yeah, um, I'm of the mindset that the ocean is for everybody to enjoy. And I don't think it's right for somebody who wants to, you know, go out there and try and push their limits and see what they're, you know, capable of physically and mentally to be told, no, you can't come out here and do this. Uh, however, there is a line that, you know, can be crossed where you become a hazard to others in the lineup and, you know, a hazard to yourself and 
ultimately it's going to fall back onto you know, those who are in the channel you know, with a plan uh, to be looking after them or saving them and in turn compromising the individuals who they're actually, the water safety team is meant to be looking for. So we gave it a lot of thought and you, know, you said there's no way of stopping anybody from you know, getting a boat or paddling off the beach that what's well, happening, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's happening. And, yeah. you know, especially with, uh, you know, inflatable vests now being available to, uh, just about anybody, you know, there's multiple brands who have you know, created them and are just selling them on online and, uh, which I don't necessarily agree with, but, um, yeah, who's, am I to say that, you know, people can or can't buy that, you know, to look after themselves and go out there. But, in opening this up to the public, it's you know really tightening up the network. Where I don't think that people go out there with any sort of you know bad intent or you know okay maybe they are a little naive to the consequences, but they're not going out there saying I don't care about you know the safety of anybody else. I'm going to compromise whatever you know that they just don't know better. So this is you know, inviting them in to learn you know sort of the structured process and protocols and. Um, and you know be able to have access that you know if they are coming over to surf mavericks for the first time or jaws that you know here's a phone number that you can call of somebody who can help organize a personal safety team you know to look after you yeah um, you know so you're not compromising you know the integrity of you know the individuals you know, programs who are already out there so um yeah it's still you know what i consider you know in the grand scheme of the safety movement in big wave surfing um wouldn't say it's in its infancy anymore but um yeah has a long way long way to grow and you know the sort of you know, the number of inquiries that we're getting uh around the world asking can we come and and teach a course uh both in big wave communities and small waves that so this information is applicable you know in any size wave you yeah, know, big, yeah. Wave, big wave is relative well exactly um, i mean everybody's limit is is different and those skills are going to be completely necessary for somebody for whom like you know six to ten foot is yeah is, is it, critical you know yeah, like, i would be so thankful if i was you know surfing a head high day down at my home break in san Clemente at lower trestles and i hit my head and got knocked out yeah. or you know i had some sort of a spinal injury and there were four people out there in the lineup who had taken this course and knew exactly you know the sort of protocol to get me in uh safely and stabilize me so and that's where honestly the majority of uh surfing injuries happen yeah sure well yeah. that's why most people are surfing isn't it yeah that basically um well my next question is related to your own experiences um so obviously you famously had a, an incident at quarters bank was that 2012 2012 yeah yeah is this been informed by that experience heavily the my accident in 2012, we were surfing a wave Cortez Bank, which is an underwater seamount 100 miles in uh, off the coast of Southern California here. And I fell on a wave that wasn't anything out of the ordinary that I hadn't wiped out on multiple times before in my life, you know, size-wise, you know, overall intensity. But it was a perfect storm of events underwater, which led me to blacking out after being held under for... Um, after trying to get to the surface of the uh, third wave and the fourth wave uh, came over before I was able to and blacked out. And if it weren't for the safety team, which was very elaborate on that particular mission because we were trying to paddle into some of the biggest waves of our lives at one of the most unpredictable and remotest and remote yeah. uh, surf locations anywhere in the world. Yeah. The safety team that we had assembled was very thorough. And if it weren't for them, you know, being right there, the moment that I'd kind of floated unconscious underwater to the inside of the lineup where eventually the energy dissipates back into deep water, you know, where they were able to get me out onto uh, the rescue sled and then back to the support boat that, you know, if that wasn't there, you know, I am 100% certain that I would have, you know, my life would have been lost, you yeah. know, drifting 100 miles in the middle of the ocean. They would have never found me. So... That was just highlighting for me the importance of taking those precautions and having that plan in place. But even still, afterwards, you know, I look back and there were thirty other things, significant things that I would have, you know, 
taken a, a mark off the total tally of, you know, was that a successful, you know, rescue that we could have done better. Right. Um, and so yeah, from that point forward, for me, you know, I don't think there's ever been a, you know, significant big wave session where that isn't the number one priority. And if, you know, things aren't in place where I feel, you know, that the absolute worst case scenario could be handled, um, you know, I really either, you know, elect not to surf that day right. or my approach when I go out there is much different than it would be, um, you know, otherwise. And I'm not using the safety team as a means of going out there and, you know, doing wild, reckless things. Yeah. But, you know, it would probably, if I wasn't totally confident, you know, dial down, you know, where I was at and really surf uh, cautiously. Yeah. I mean, I guess what's interesting about what you're talking about and also, you mentioned at the beginning of that when you were telling that story that it was a, a, a you, you make it sound like an average day really you know like there's something that you'd experienced before i guess what i'm getting at is was there a feeling that until the seriousness of that incident you almost took the protocol for granted in some way you kind of expected that maybe it it would work and did the seriousness of the situation surprise you given the the experiences that you'd had at that time what surprised me was, yeah, in all the years of doing this, I've been uh, on the opposite end of that. Usually, the one you know, helping somebody or rescuing somebody. Not that I ever dismissed the fact that it couldn't be my life that was being saved. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. but um, you yeah, know, the reality of it, you know, when it all hit afterwards, and I was sitting out there, you know, waiting for the coast guard to come pick me up and being lifted out of there in a basket was was much heavier than anything i had ever you know imagined possible yeah um, you know it was, it was essentially a, a worst case scenario uh, so, you know I, short of short of me having died short you know, of dying was, yeah, yeah. You, you like you you survived but uh -huh. it couldn't have got any worse other than dying basically yeah yeah so um that was you know very awakening for me um but not not in the sense that you know, I had never been so naive thinking, oh, I'm, I'm invincible. Yeah. And, you know, that, that was always, uh, you know, I think for most competent big wave surfers who have put in the time, you know, nearly all of us have, you know, experienced a death in the lineup at, at some point or, you know, maybe weren't necessarily there, but, you know, a friend uh, has passed in the process. You know, we've lost a handful of them over the last uh um, 10 or so years, but, um, that also in, in turn for me was, uh, a very pivotal moment in my life where, and, you know, I, I reflect on it now and, you know, I get a smile, um, thinking about it. You know, one, the beauty of the fact that I, you know, had a second chance at life, but, uh, the state of forced reflection that it, uh, Put me into you know to really contemplate you know, what i was doing why and you know what i wanted to be doing moving forward where um yeah i could probably talk for hours on what my motivations were you know at different stages of my you know life from you know the first time i really you know fell in love with big wave surfing you know between 13 and 15 years old and then you know what i was looking for when i was 18 years old and and then at that point I was 30 years old and I feel like I had lost, I didn't know if there was a real meaningful inspiration that was driving me so much as it was just, you know, this is who I am, this is what I do. And I naturally have to keep trying to you know, push myself, you know, to, greater extremes ride bigger waves and you know that was one of the locations you know only had been surfed uh you know less than a dozen times we'd only started you know seeing realizing oh that it's paddleable you know we always use the jet ski to tow in and so you know I was going to go out here in the middle of the ocean to you know to try and paddle into the biggest wave you know that i could out there so and you know in, in retrospect i don't feel like um, I may have been in it 
Well, that there was enough real substance behind um, the motivation for going that far out there. Yeah, I mean, um, it seems when you've talked about it in the past, it seems like it made you reevaluate your surfing identity and also like your 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 own identity on like a you know real basic like ego level, really. You mm-hmm. know, like in and a, and a, almost like a you know your own masculinity, like what 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 it kind of means like why you put yourself in these positions and that that really c- comes across when i've I've read things where you've talked about it as if they, this whole process was made you reevaluate that yeah uh in, entirely and it was you know looking back it was going to take something that significant to slow me down you know and and really sit with it for a long time you know i'd had you know a handful of very close you know calls you know don't want to necessarily call them near death experiences, but you know, very significant wipeouts to where you know, if it weren't for you know, one thing you know going right of my leash not breaking, or um, you know, then it could have been a, a different result. And you know, it was always just okay. You know, brush that one off the shoulder. Yeah, you know, that's exactly why you've you know trained you know, extensively, physically, mentally, why you had your safety team there and you can you rationalize. Know, yeah. Those. And you know, on on we go. You know, when's yeah. the when's the next swell? You where, can square it off and be like, oh, yeah. okay, well that's why that happened and it's fine. Uh huh. Where there was no getting <clears throat> around this one and and believe me, I tried. You know, yeah. I had people, you know I'll just get back on get the back horse. On the horse. And there so was, was a contest up at Mavericks I was gonna say. Know, two weeks later. And um, you know, thankfully that was um, that was one of the smaller Mavericks contests that we've we've had to where you know it was what by you know, the standards up there would be considered a a small day. It yeah. was beautiful and sunny and um, you know, but mentally it was just in this total state of you know turmoil and but man- managed to you know to perform well just kind of based off of muscle memory. But you know what was happening you know emotionally inside of me was. Um, you know, it was one of the greatest sort of psychological warfare games I had ever you know, been a part of. And it only continued to get worse thereafter. I still feel like I was in a state of shock at that point. Sure. And then as the months went on, and then after that, people thought, oh, he's fine, he's back. Uh, it just went downhill from there to where, you know, I didn't even want to, you know, go in the ocean, didn't want to go surfing, didn't even want to think about it yet. Uh, my identity had been, you know, built upon that, and there's the expectations of sponsors and, you know, my own ego getting in the way of you know, worrying about what other people may perceive if I were to, you know, walk away from it or not. So, which everyone can recognize, I think, but but with you in this case, obviously, it's such a critical act that you need to be completely, you know, if you're going to be safe and perform and and performing that environment like you like you want to enjoy it then obviously you need to completely be reconciled with it yeah and that's um you can tell in a big wave lineup you know and it's the people who are still doing it you know 20 years later who have pure intentions behind it you know in this deep love um and they're the ones who are you know lifelong big wave surfers where there are other people who may have ulterior motives whether they want to you know get famous or you know impress somebody and you know they show up and you know one bad wipeout or you know even not really they're you know you know egos you know checked into the sidelines and you know you don't see a lot of them again and so for me trying to go back without um a you know without that love you know behind it was extremely difficult yeah so how long did it take for you to to succeed in this evolution to the point where you did feel comfortable again? Uh, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, I still have days where there's just something that doesn't feel right. And you, know, you could probably trace it back to, you know, to all of that. And, you know, I just decide, okay, you know, or I'm okay with it now. Or yeah, it's like, but you know, it's... I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not going to push it where before you'd have done it. I would have always seen that as, okay, here's a mental challenge that, you know, is before you and you have to find a way to, you know, navigate your way, you know, 
trick whatever it is that's you know setting off this um it's that kind of masculine expression though isn't it you mm -hmm. know like you kind of feel like you say it's, it's, um, it's linked to ego you feel like you need to do it yeah but i would say honestly it was um i'm horrible with the dates of everything it's a bit of a blur but it was the first uh jaws competition i think it was maybe 2015 um so pretty much three years later or maybe it would have been two winter seasons i'm not too sure you know because um, they overlap 2015 2016 um but it was about a year before i went back and i felt like i had my first you know respectably comfortable big wave session to where i was teetering on the edge of, okay, I'm, I'm enjoying this again versus, you know, sort of tied up in the emotional turmoil. And um, and then little by little, and, and that all happened kind of from getting to a point where, well, not kind of, I got to a point where I just, you know, I accepted you know, the sort of new set of rules that I was, you know, living under that you stopped worrying about getting back to, you know, how things were in the past, but really just, all right, you know, this is how you're feeling. This is what, you know, you know, you're going through and, you know, don't be bummed out or, you know, be hard on yourself because you weren't, you know, comfortably turning around on the biggest set of the day. Just, you know, remember why you're in it, having fun and, you know, surf to where you're enjoying it, not, you know, based on, uh, you know, past expectations that you had for yourself and little by little it you know started to you know, come back you know rather you know the emotional attachment that i had had to that event um, started to diminish or rather you know just kind of absorbing it and then it was the jaws competition the first one that we'd ever had and it was this absolutely massive windy day that you know probably would have never paddled out if that were any you know just an average day um but here's you know the hype of okay first ever big wave world tour event and uh, i remember texting with one of my best friends uh the evening before you know he always you know calls or writes me a, a thoughtful message of you know you know have fun be safe and you know, i wrote back to him and you know this is one where everyone was like oh my god it's gonna be you know 60 feet and uh, I wrote him back and I was like, you know what? I honestly don't know if I'm going to surf in the morning. You know, that if I get out there and it looks just out of control, like you know, I will be totally okay with handing my spot to somebody else or sitting way over on the shoulder and, you know, I don't care how I, how I do. And, you know, it wasn't just me saying it, but I felt like I actually, you know, that that was the the honest truth and what i felt in my heart and the irony was when i got there in the morning and i looked at it and it was just this you know hellacious <laughs> wind and you know biggest that anybody had ever tried to paddle it at that point and i put on the jersey and of course all the boats cameras water safety and i paddled over there into the lineup and just sat out the back you know, is where I kind of normally would. And without even thinking, you know, the first big, you know, clean wave that I felt like I had an entrance into just as natural as can be, you know, turn around and, you know, went. Didn't even think twice. And um, ended up not making around the shoulder of that one and then, you know, paddled back out and just sat and waited again. And then the next giant set was one of those like, ah, I think I can get into this one too. And you know, had this crazy airdrop and pulled into a real dramatic barrel, which ended up being uh, a closeout. Didn't make it, but you know, enormous barrel and everybody in the channel is freaking out. And and after that, I just you know paddled over and sat and was like, okay, that's it. Like I'm done. Like I remembered, yeah, you know, I remember what it felt like to, you know, have no attachment to the outcome. I'm out here just to have fun, no expectations, and you know, if it feels right, like you know, I'm gonna go on these big waves and. Uh, and so that was sort of you know, where I was like, okay, like almost um, 
you know, reconciling with the whole, you know, big wave surfing thing. Yeah. So how did that feel? Oh, it was one of the greatest you know, accomplishments of my um, of my surfing life, with without a doubt. You know, for me, no, unquestionably, I'm not going to say one of that was. Um, you know, and yeah, you know, it was the journey of those couple of years in, in between in the you know emotional roller coaster and um and then as i said still now you know that wasn't just that all of a sudden i'm back and now i'm you know on that same you know big wave trajectory that i once was yeah um, it sounds you know, like or have that level of confidence that it would you know some days i would feel good some days i wouldn't um and i really just stopped caring or worrying about uh yeah whichever it, it was it sounds like it's going to be ongoing yeah yeah i i wouldn't be surprised if it but uh you know what it also led me to do was you know, reflect on you know what i felt to be important in my yeah, life and, which was going to be my next question really because it when you've got a, you know a turning point like that in somebody's life it sounds like there was reevaluation on a lot of levels yeah significantly and you know a big part of it was looking at where you know i was putting my you know energy in life where f- most of it to that point was you know, towards this passion of you know big wave surfing and the way i see it it was um and the way i explain it you know that was my arena for self exploration to see what i was capable of physically and mentally and um it most certainly served its purpose and that event um you know 30 years old forced me to sit down and and really contemplate okay you know how much longer you know if you do go back and do this again um you know and this even continued after that you know great session at, at jaws you know if you do continue this again you know why and you know what is going to come from it that you haven't already experienced or done or learned you know if this was you know if this is and as you i acknowledge all along my arena for self-exploration i saw a lot and i learned a lot and you know the thought of carrying on the amount of time that was put into training and you know following these swells you know was i really going to experience something that you know, it was going to be life changing that I hadn't, you know, I'd ridden some of the biggest waves, uh, in the world. I would traveled to more countries than I could you know, remember, have amazing friends and family around the globe, uh, immersed within, you know, numerous different cultures. And, you know, was I going to keep going back to all these, you know, same places? Um, and so I just thought about it, you know, with what it would take to continue to pursue this you know, is the return on that and, you know, the personal enrichment that I'm going to get out of it, you know, really worth it. And it didn't feel like it was. And it was in that state of reflection as well. I'd thought about, you know, well, you know, it, it cuts out all of the, the white noise and, you know, bullshit and ego in your life of, of what's truly important. And, you know, another big wave or a competition it didn't register on that. Um, if I was to distill it down, it was really for me, you know, with all of this tremendous fortune, what, you know, what are you giving back to the world? You know, what sort of, and I know that I always kind of, um, I toil with this idea, you know, is that there is a big part of the ego in it, but, you know, it's like, you know, what is your legacy going to, to be where there's a part of me that's like, well, why are you even, you know, why are you worried about that? You know, that you want to be known or remembered for something. But um, I do feel deep down that there's, um, at least there's a part of me that feels obligated to, you know, leave the world a better place um, or, you know, just leave an imprint of, of love. And, you know, I felt like, you know, the virtues in which I was living my life, you know, would have really, um, you know, maybe could have, you know, walked away or looked back and thought, yeah, okay, that was sufficient enough. But man, the fortune that I had had, 
the family supports the friends the opportunity i just felt like you know there's there's more to this and what you see when you're you know traveling to the world especially you know developing nations and the you know environmental social injustices you know that are happening all around the world uh, you know as i was traveling those years really weighed heavy on me and um you know did my best you know within the time and free energy that i had to be um to be giving back um but at that point you know i thought about what i wanted to be doing next and you know it was finding ways to use my platform in surfing and and give back more to the world yeah so how how are you practically doing that at the moment then the last few years i've been uh, really putting a lot of time and effort into raising awareness for ocean plastic pollution which i feel is one of the most pressing issues of our time uh along with climate change and uh kind of waking people up to sort of where i feel like you know, where we're at as far as you know our human impact on the natural world and you know we've you know reached a tipping point you know where if we don't change now you know our behavior uh, yeah i am afraid to imagine what could happen in the coming you know 15 20 years down the road when it comes to our planet there's a very intricate and delicate balance in our natural world you know, between all living things especially you know our ocean which sustains and provides life you know us to you know exist on this planet you know, as a human species and we're throwing that balance off at a staggering rate people don't realize it you know especially those who may not be down there at the beach every single day or intimately connected with it but you know we all um, we all are whether we realize it or not and getting people to start to think about you know th their own personal impact and you know the ways that they can you know lessen that become more sensitive and that you know all these issues it's our you know collective burden to share that there's not going to be one person that you know comes up with a sort of a bullet cure that's going to uh, clean up all the ocean of plastic you know so long as we continue to keep producing it and carelessly uh, you know consuming and, and disposing of it or you know co2 emissions you know nobody's going to come up with uh, you know, some brilliant idea that yeah, you know, we're in it together. You know, we didn't get to this point without you know, billions of people participating, and you know, I think it's going to take billions of people to participating if we're ever going to you know, reverse it. And so, a big mission of mine has been traveling to these coastal communities and beyond, and you know, sharing what I've seen and I've experienced, and also what I've learned you know, in recent years, having the opportunity to spend time with you know, leading scientists, researchers who are at the forefront of you know, the scientific investigation of you know, what is actually happening, and uh, leaving people with you know, simple ideas of how they can change their daily habits to help mitigate the, the impact, and um, and hopefully you know, we're able to collectively influence um, uh, you know, our politicians to be implementing more you know, dramatic uh, you know, changes um, and sort of reverse the course that, that we're on. So how would you encourage other people that might be listening to this and feeling the same, you know, obviously as aware of the problems you are, because I think obviously everybody's aware of it. Um, and what, what we're talking about is how quickly it's going to take for people to catch up really i think because it is inevitable they will need to be addressed let's say mm -hmm. so if you if there's people listening to this that, that are wondering where to start on their own involvement in this what how would you recommend they they got involved one of the first things i share with people is to not be overwhelmed at the scope and size you know of these problems that i said no one person is going to be able to uh solve it that it's going to take everybody so you know focus on your life and you know don't think about changing the world think about changing you know your world you know yourself you know influencing change within your family members within your community and that's something that everybody you know can we all have a sort of sphere of influence so you know looking at plastic pollution there's 
a number of different alternatives for all of the you know, single-use plastics that we encounter on a daily basis, whether it's you know, reusable cups, straws, uh, reusable bags. So dive into using all of those, obviously, and then you know, wherever you know, absolutely possible, simply avoid plastic. Hopefully, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there you know, looking and researching and trying to find a... An, an alternative entirely, which is you know, the end goal. Um, but then looking, you know, if you are going to be consuming uh, for the products that, you know, do have post-consumer, you know, recycled materials in them, or the brands that uh, are really um, making an effort to manage their carbon footprints uh, or using sustainable materials. So really micromanaging you know, your consumption behavior. You know, we're presented with you know, hundreds of choices every single day, and, and those add up you know, when you start to think of you know, the millions of people in you know, your country. Um, so simply understanding that you know, we're all in this together and that complacency is you know, our greatest enemy in our threat, thinking that somebody else is going to, to solve the problem. And rising to the occasion, and then being a voice and sharing you know, what you've learned, what you know, uh, with other people. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes that I always uh, love sharing when I'm talking about this, uh, it's from a book, the Bhagavad Gita, and it says, uh, what the outstanding person does, others will try and do, and the standards that such people create will be followed by the world. And when you think about your life, who we've become, it's large, you know, in the way that we think, the way our behavior patterns, it's largely a byproduct of those people who we've been interacting with since we were, you know, children, our parents, our friends, teachers. And, you know, what if we could go back and, you know, a generation or two, and if everybody had adopted these ideas and behaviors and were living it out, you know, we'd be in a much different place than we are now. And it's not too late to to start now. In fact, it has to start now or, you know, or else, you know, who knows what the future will hold. And, and then hopefully, you know, and obviously, you know, you look at the systemic, it's a larger systemic issue, you know, where we've are living in uh, you know, culture and society now that is teaching us and trying to you know, instill these ideas that we do need to be consuming more in order to keep up with you know, whoever else that every single season there's a new, you know, fashion trend that you need to to buy this and yeah. And starting to, you know, reject those um those ideas. Um and that, you know, this isn't who I feel like we're meant to it's not the way that we're meant to be to be living. Um and then in turn, you know, through our own, you know, influence that, you know, our consumption behaviors uh, drive change, you know, whether it is for, you know, new innovation and in something. And, and in this case, it, you know, would be no different that if people took a stand and said, you know, we want to be using environmentally conscious materials over, you know, the single plastic that, you know, you've been doing, uh, the industry, I think, will, you know, change and follow along with it. Yeah, using that influence, basically, because mm -hmm. it, consumer influence, like you say, the more people that, that get behind it, then the more it will affect change. Absolutely. You mentioned, this is going to be my final question. You, you mentioned earlier that um, you'd, you'd always felt a bit of a desire to kind of leave a mark or, you know, feel like your life was kind of had a purpose, let's say, which I think is, is a natural human mm -hmm. instinct, really. Yeah. Um, but you, you, sound, you mentioned that it seemed like you're a little bit uncomfortable with that in this context. Is that something that you've learned to make peace with if you know what i'm getting at yeah it i have and that's you know where i look at people who i've met in my life and the impact that they had on me or an idea that they instilled that completely reshaped the way i was thinking and um and for me and those experiences and the ones that i've held on to you know it's always been 
uh, a positive thing. Obviously, I've met a lot of assholes in my, uh, <laughs> yeah, as, I, as I know, we, as I know, we all have, and yeah, plenty you, know, of them you, you, you don't dismiss them, <laughs> but it is those you know who leave behind that pearl of wisdom, or you know whether it's their generosity. Um, you know, we all know we've we've come across yeah, they them. Yeah, can, can come from the unlikeliest places. As yeah, well. that there's a part of them that's you know that you absorb. Yeah, and it you know essentially becomes you and um, you know lightens up your your world and in turn you know hopefully inspires you to be doing the same. And in the end, you know, when I look back at it and I've contemplated you know my mortality and you know especially having come so close to you know losing my life you know if you know if i look back now you know what would i want people to remember me as and it's you know could care less about the surfing you know that if it was simply that you know here was somebody who you know when i was around them you know, made me feel good uh inspired you know wanting to love a little bit deeper and you know help other people and help you know, the natural world, which, um, you know, we appreciate so much and has given us so many opportunities to thrive on many levels. Um, you know, that's what's valuable to me. That's a really great point to end it, Greg. Thanks so much, man. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So there you go. That was the first episode of Type 2, my new show in association with Patagonia. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please let me know by dropping me a line at podcast at wearelookingsideways.com or over on my Instagram at We Look Sideways. Now, I'm going to be releasing new episodes of Type 2 every month or so. They're going to appear in my usual Looking Sideways channel, which you can subscribe to via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If it's your first time checking out what I do, make sure you check out my back catalogue. You can find it at www.wearelookingsideways.com. There's over 80 interviews there with some of the biggest names in action sports and other related endeavours. Reckon you'll find a few that you'll enjoy there. Thanks for listening to this one and I'll see you next time. Nice one. Mm-hmm.